Senator Carpenter, Senator Caslin, Senator Givens, Senator Howe, Senator Parrott, Senator Thayer. Here. Senator Webb, Senator West, Senator Westerfield, Senator Wise. Here. Representative Callaway. Here. Representative Dixon, Representative Dossett, Representative Fister. Here. Representative Flood. Here. Representative Graham. Representative Hart. Here. Representative Heron. Representative Vimes. Here. Representative Kim King. Present. Representative Cook. Here. Representative Kokarney. Representative McPherson. Here. Representative Pollock. Here. Representative Pratt. Here. Representative, Representative Rayburn. Representative Raymond. Representative Reed. Representative Stevenson. Here. Representative Here. Tate. Here. Representative Thomas. Here. Representative Tipton. Here. Senator Hornback. Here. And Chairman Representative Heath. Here. We have a quorum. We do have a quorum. Welcome, everyone. Um, I see several guests in the audience, more than, than we normally have, so why don't we start by introducing guests. Um, Representative Tate, you can go first. Thank you very much. I have my granddaughter, Claire Hardy, with me today. Thank you. Welcome. I see a group in the back with white shirts on that... Uh, Represent Pollock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome the American Legion Boys State group here today. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Pat Keefe from Campbellsville, who represents our local American Legion group there as well. So welcome to uh, Frankfurt, men. Welcome, gentlemen. <clears throat> Who's next? Okay, if we've got everybody, um, I have some guests today. My wife, Ruth, is visiting with me today, along with our friends from Graves County, Melissa Collier, and her two daughters, Anna and Addie. Welcome. <clears throat> and last but not least, we have a new um, analyst for our Ag Committee, uh, Hillary Abbott. So if you'll stand and be recognized. Welcome, Hillary. And I think that's got uh, our introductions out of the way. Let's uh, move on with business, and we're going to flip the schedule and let our um, USDA Farm Service first. So, Dean, if, if you and your guests will come to the table. Welcome back, Representative Smore. <laughs> Is, is your mic on? Now it is. Get, Thank you. Getting a little rusty there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, if you'll introduce yourself and sure. your guest for the record, and, and then the floor is yours. Sure. Way. Well, yeah. Dean Shamora, the state executive director for Farm Service Agency. And it's good to be here at one of the finest committees in Frankfurt, doing a lot for the farmers here. And, uh, and uh, it was a great committee to be on, so it's good to be in front of you. And I'll let them introduce themselves. My name is Mike Hoy. Thank you for my own. My name is Mike Hoyt. I'm with the Farm Service Agency. Uh, I work here in Lexington, and I work over in Lexington, rather, and I'm the Farm Loan Chief for the loan side. Awesome. My name is Jennifer Farmer, and I'm the Farm Programs Chief here in Lexington. And you live where? Uh, I'm originally from Mayfield. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to get that plug in there. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, at, at the FSA, of course, our main job is to uh, uh, be their safety net for the farmer. And as you know, we had a, a, a lot going on across the nation, across the country. And then in Kentucky, of course, we were plagued with uh, a devastating tornado, uh, Mr. Chairman, that got your uh, county uh, in the bull's eye and uh, a lot of damage, uh, a lot of distraction to uh, farming there and uh, at a bad time, at a bad time when hard to get stuff rebuilt, uh, you know, uh, price of materials higher. So just a really devastating time for those farmers. And uh, of course, still trying to work through that and uh, definitely be working through it here as, as uh, you know, you try to get your crops in 
here in the fall. So uh, uh, that that's uh, definitely on our radar at FSA. Of course, our main job is uh, to implement the Farm Bill, to do what the U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate uh, put in their Farm Bill. And, uh, you know, we carry that out. Uh, you know, we have it's pretty straightforward what what we can do and what we can't do the programs that we offer and uh, then uh, as things change there's programs that can that pop up to help just like it did uh, with the uh, tornado and and we had several programs to help uh, the people and not only of Graves County but uh, several other counties in Kentucky where the you know there was a lot of lot of loss mm -hmm. and so the my guests I brought with me today so they're uh, uh, they're both longtime employees with USDA, unlike myself, who's been there since January the 3rd. And uh, so I, I'd like for them to tell a little bit about what they do. Um, uh, and, and I'll start with Mike. Mike does the uh, farm loans. And uh, and as we talk about, you know, people trying to rebuild after the tornado, you know, he has some uh, he has some products over there that, that would help people with that. As well, as, you know, of course, there's a big uh, new uh, beginning farmers and there's always a push on that, especially as our uh, the farmer population is is aging. The average age of the farmer is increasing, so it's it's good to bring new people up. And uh, at USDA, that's definitely a, a, a big focus. So uh, if you could, Mike, just tell me a little about the, some of the farm loan programs we have. Well, we have. We actually have two programs within the state or within and the agency. Mike, you, you may need to pull your mic closer. If, we, have, we have two different uh, main programs. We have a guarantee and we have a direct. On the guarantee program, what it is is the lender is actually the one who is uh, who will be servicing and making the loan, and we are backing the loan. We're giving them a guarantee up to 90%. And on the direct side, what it is is we basically have a lower interest rate, longer terms on some of those, don't have to have a down payment. So it's a good assistance in helping men and women get into farming, uh, and, and especially beginning farmers and SDA. We're really pushing that. We have special funds for that. We get special funds every year. We can make term loans and uh, annual loans. Let's say a FO we call farm ownership. Uh, we can go up to 40 years on that on the direct side. And the interest rate is three point, I'm going to have to write it down, 3.75 I think right now. And the operating side can be made for either an annual or a term. The term would be seven years and uh, the annual would be one year, of course, and that would be for inputs and so forth or feed or livestock. Uh, I don't know how much you all want to actually hear. I'm going to brag on the state right now. Uh, we're fifth nationally almost every year. Since I've been there, the, the eight years I've been there, we were sixth the first two years, and then, and then the six years after that, we've been fifth in the nation. And if you think about it, think about Kentucky, its size, and what we produce and have here in the state. And what we are is we're, we're an odd state that this half of the state is is very good agriculture area, and this side of the state is better suited for pasture and hay and so forth. And that's not to say it's not across the state, but, uh, and we lead the nation, have every year I've been there in microloans, and microloan is up to $50,000. It's another way for, to get a, a man or a woman into farming on a lower scale and then build them. And as Dean was talking, really there's three things that we try to do. We try to help men and women get into farming, sustain their farming operation, and then for expansion. And I don't know how detailed you all want me to get on some of this. I mean, I could go on for a while, but I really don't. We'll let, let you all could definitely ask us questions here after they both. Okay, yeah, we'll hear do. from, from Olivia sure. and then open it up for questions. Sure. sure. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer? First, thank you all so much for inviting us to be here. It's um, good to be able to kind of give you an overview of what we do. Today I'm going to tell you mostly about the programs that we had the tornado is freshly on everyone's mind, kind of some of the programs that we've been able to put in um, to assist people with that. Um, as I'm sure Mr. Heath has told you, the pictures just don't do it justice until you go there, and it is truly unbelievable. Um, but some of the things we've been able to do to help is we have a program called the Emergency Conservation Program. And currently we have 19 counties uh, in the state uh, doing that program that were affected by the tornado. And what that is, is it, if there is a natural disaster, we can help with, for example, for the tornado, we're doing debris cleanups of crop fields. So we're able to help reimburse for the farmers uh, for the expense that they have um, to get that 
land ready to put in ag. And then we also have a program that will help with the restoration and repair of fences. So currently, like I said, we have 19 counties and uh, today it's uh, just over $8 million that has been requested in those 19 counties. So we are excited to be able to put that out there and be able to help these people with that. Um, number two, we have a program that's the Livestock Indemnity Program. This program is not an emergency program. It is in the Farm Bill, but it, we were able to help some of the people that have like a poultry operation where they lost their entire operation because those losses of the chickens were directly related to an adverse weather event. We were able to help reimburse them for some of their loss. So that was very beneficial to those affected. Uh, and thirdly, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, they lost uh, Mayfield Grain, which is one of the largest granaries there locally. Uh, and I've talked to them. They uh, have the capability to store uh, 6 million bushels, and they are going to be storing zero uh, for the 2022 crop year. So not only is that going to affect the 400 people that deliver their grain or store their grain directly to them, it's also going to affect countless people in the neighboring area that just bring and deliver their grain there, not to mention um, affecting how they can market their crop because they're not going to be able to have storage, so they're just going to have to go, you know, whatever the day they shell, it's the price they're going to get. So uh, one program that we have available that we have seen a huge influx in is the Farm Storage Facility Program. That is part of the Farm Bill. It's always been available, but as you can imagine, everyone is jumping on that bandwagon and it is a great program depending on the amount of the loan it can go up to 12 years currently our interest rate is anywhere from 2.875 to 3 percent which is phenomenal um, but with the huge influx of everybody wanting to build at the same time they can't get supplies it's very improbable that we're going to have those ready by the time that they have shelled their corn and then the other concern is you know some operations just it's not feasible to at the expense of the on-farm storage. So I know there's some talk of maybe some programs that might be able to help some of that because you're going to have an increase in cost for fuel because you're going to have to haul it further. You're going to have to have more drivers because you're going to ha not have a quick turnaround. Um, just several things like that. So um, we're hoping that maybe we can get something this fall to be able to, to help those that are affected by that. So <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you. We do have some questions or comments if y'all sure. want us to start down that road. Sure. Uh, Representative Pratt. You mentioned uh, farm loans. To Y'all you know, do farm loans. Uh, as the raising in, uh, interest rates try to curb the runaway inflation right now, how's that affecting you all uh, and your loans? I, you, you touched on the uh, on your part, but on your part of it, how does that how's that affecting your, your rates, or have you seen them go up yet? The rates have gone up. They can, they can go up on a monthly basis. Uh, Actually, we're seeing right now, uh, it's kind of scattered right now, but we're seeing a downturn in applications, which I can't explain it right now. I don't know if one of the other gentlemen I saw, uh, Mr. Snell was here, maybe he knows a, a reason. Uh, some people are trying to relate it to ARPA, that people are waiting to see if there's a payoff. I don't think that, because you still have to operate. So I don't understand where we are right now, and it may just be a, may just be a turn down. But the, the gentlemen are going to have to have their operating money. And the, the, when I say gentlemen, I mean farmers, uh, men are women. But uh, it, it, uh, it's a temporary thing, I hope, and, and we'll see a, turn, a turnaround in it uh, relatively quick. May I have a follow-up, sir? Yes. When you say increase, could you say 1%, 2%? Do you have a percentage yet? No, uh, we hardly ever a quarter of a percent, seems like, when we're going up. Now, just recently this month from uh, – from May to June, we saw about seven tenths of a percent uh, rise in the FO, and so uh, we're going to continue to see a little bit. I suspect we'll see interest rates go up as we try to curb inflation. But yeah, uh, thanks, sir. We're customarily about two percent, three percent behind the private sector. Thanks, sir. Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, you mentioned briefly about fencing, and I was just wondering if we could have just a little bit more information about that. When those horrible tornadoes hit, our family was getting information that from the livestock standpoint, uh, fencing 
was one of the greatest needs and not covered by some of the traditional people or organizations that might be able to help. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? And is it restricted to like boundary fences or are interior on the same property fences available? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, the It's not uh, restricted to boundary fences. It's any existing fence as long as it was being used to maintain livestock. Um, the, I'm not sure who, what organization said that we couldn't do that, but Farm Service Agency absolutely can help with the restoration and repair of the fences. And that's one of the things that we're seeing uh, across the affected areas. Um, may, may I ask just one follow-up, Chair? Sure. Where are we in having those fences repaired? I know the, the infrastructure, the brick and mortar is going to take quite a long time, but are those folks getting or how much of that fence has been replaced right. or repaired? The majority has been replaced and repaired. At least probably almost every farm has had some and then to get everything, you know, put back up and then we're working on the rest of it. But um, when, like I said, the $8 million that we've requested, it has been requested. We have not necessarily received all the funding from Washington yet. So as the guys and gals finish up their fencing, they bring the bills in, but we're still waiting on the funding to be able to pay them. So that's also an issue. It always is with that program though. <laughs> uh-huh. Chairman Hornback. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jennifer, uh, do your all's programs on grain storage for temporary grain storage and stuff, do they allow for like the baggers and stuff? I mean, to assist farmers in trying to get some grain stored, are you doing that too? The farm storage facility alone is for permanent structures or refrigerator trucks or tr semis, trailers, that kind of thing. So as far as the, it would have to be considered permanent. And I know some of those are getting where they might, we might, they might be considered permanent, but we have not seen any yet. Do you see any movement from D.C. to allow that for those emergency areas, those 19 counties? Or is that being requested? I'll, I'll, I'll speak on that. Uh, so uh, so Senator, Senator McConnell had put some language in a bill, and and it talked more about ports, and which is something that probably just can't really happen fast. And, you know, we would like to see something happen fast. So uh, Farm Bureau has been involved uh, along with Senator McConnell's office and, uh, you know, talking to USDA uh, about if there are some other options. And it would be uh, probably more of a temporary type or, or, mm -hmm. or prefer long term. We just know that people aren't going to be able to get, you know, you can't find some materials and you may not be able to get, you know, uh, I think we lost, what was it, about a half a million mm -hmm. uh, worth of uh, half a million bushels of a private storage. So it's, it's hard for all those people to build back, plus everyone who is taking it to Mayfield for them to find something. So so I, I think in Washington, D.C., they're working with Senator McConnell's office to, you know, to, to – and there was no funding there. It was it was just you know, find some funds to do that. So that makes it a little difficult too. And I, I think the way some of those programs were writ written, uh, there wasn't a lot of latitude. So USDA can't just come up with a program uh, because w uh, when those bills are written, it was really tight the language in that. So not a lot of flexibility. So trying to work around that. So be good to have a bridge of some type. Yes, sir. Just one further question, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. Yes. Uh, Dean, how are you on staffing? Well, so as you all know, uh, uh, these officers took a big hit after tobacco. Uh, they've really, you know, and, and I know uh, my predecessor, uh, Brian Lacefield, is behind me, and I think they stayed pretty constant during his term. You know, you lose a couple, you pick a couple up, and, and so far that's what happened this year. I, I gained one on the federal side. I lost two on the county side. They did change some language where – uh, we're allowed to, to go up to our cap, which which helps us out, too. Of course, we have turnover. There's We have a little over 300 employees and 64 county offices, and it, it, it makes it difficult. And I know you've expressed some concerns in Shelby County. Plus, we have problems like other places, you know, uh, finding people and being able to keep people. And we're especially having that problem on our, our farm loan side uh, because uh, banks are making a lot of money. And, uh, you know, basically these people are bankers. They're giving loans. So they... We have a great training program, so uh, it seems to be that people come over and go through our training program, and then, you know, a bank picks them up, uh, an ag-related bank picks them up and 
you know, he takes them from us. And of course we can't, but well, we pay really good. And of course we have great benefits, but you know, a private bank can offer, you know, whatever they want. So it's, uh, it's hard to compete. So with that being said, you know, uh, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me anytime. If you all know people in your community that would like to be uh, on the ag lending side, be, be happy to take them and give them the process applying for some of those jobs. Uh, of course, one thing people have to keep in mind when they apply for a job with FSA is, is, you know, we're for the whole state. So it's hard just to, you know, you, now when we advertise for those jobs, we tell where those jobs are at, but, but some jobs within, you know, you have to move around and maybe move your family to a different area. If, if you have flexibility in FSA, it works out really well. Cause, uh, and I have two people beside me here, you know, Mike's from Warren County and with his job, he has, he has a place in Lexington and same with Jennifer. She's from Graves, but lives in Lexington. So some flexibility, but you know, we do have some good jobs and we do have current openings and, uh, and farm loan people to go through our training and, and, uh, and it is a, a good job. Thank you. Um, Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to have you. I heard they have a question for Jennifer. You referenced, uh, for the poultry producers who had weather related incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a big issue with avian flu and disease causing depopulation. Producers mm -hmm. are having lost income, because lost revenue because of that do you do any of your programs uh, uh, available for a, a, a producer in that situation it's very ironic that you ask we in the last month have we had a county that was having a, a terrible time with that and we they did the work we brought it before the state committee and recommended that to Washington and they've just approved that in about the last six weeks mr. chairman if I could have an additional quick yes. question uh, yes. This is for Director Shamor. With with all your new responsibilities, how's your beef herd doing? Are they missing you? Are they looking for you? Or are you able to get them taken care of? Well, my six cattle, they're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just enough to understand the language, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Representative Kulkarni. Thank you, Chairman. Good to see you, Director, and thank you all for presenting today. I just have a couple of questions. Um, first, I was curious, uh, just for my information, what is the range of interest rates from, you know, microloans all the way to just regular? The, uh, we have farm ownership and uh, farm ownership, conservation loans. Those, those are all the same rate. And then on the operating side, Basically, we're going to have two rates unless you get into an emergency loan, and they're going to try to pair that because in the past it was so much easier to process an operating loan than it was an EM, so they're going to try to pair those. And so an emergency loan would essentially be 3.25 just like an operating. Okay, and the same for, I guess, the microloans? Or is that... Microloan, yes. Okay. Depending and then... on be an FO or an OL, and you could do it either way, farm ownership or an operating loan. Okay, thank you. And then very quickly, you had mentioned that Kentucky was fifth in the nation. Fifth. I was curious, on, and I probably missed it. I apologize. On, was it... on total loans obligated. Total loans. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Representative McPherson. Yeah, so you all talked about the uh, poultry industry and the hit that they took there. What's your time frame, you think, on them coming back fully? And do you think all of them will come back fully? Do you think all of the producers will build back? As a poultry producer myself, no. <laughs> they probably won't. Some of the um, older barns that, if, if your barn was older and it was destroyed and you had it paid for, the expense of building it back it's probably not gonna the profit margin is probably not gonna be there for you to do that um, now some of the newer ones that would be a different story about them building back but um, another thing I didn't mention is our our local plant there Pilgrim's Pride the feed mill where they bring us our feed from the chickens it got damaged and so another local plant Tyson is helping uh, with all of that getting us chickens that they have been super. They've worked great together. And so we are back getting chickens and our feed, and the ones of us that have barns are back in operation. What time frame do you think you'll be before you're, where you're kind of be fully recovered from this? I mean, in our area, we've got producers, and we know they're trying to kind of ask them to overproduce a little bit, trying to make up the difference. But, but how long will it be before it stabilizes, you think? I would say two years. 
Thank you. And, and since we're talking about uh, pilgrims and poultry, uh, pilgrims also lost two of their hatcheries. And within a couple of days of, of the tornado coming through Mayfield, our commissioner uh, Corals was was in town, and we met with pilgrims and um, met with some of the farmers. The big issue is is getting the birds hatched and out to the barns. Uh, I talked to one young farmer that had just completed uh, some new houses. He had gotten one flock through the houses, mm -hmm. and um, Pilgrims was able to make arrangements to get birds from some other suppliers, but they could only get half of what yeah. they needed. So you can imagine being a, a young mm -hmm. startup farmer and having all these loans and, and millions of dollars in, in new buildings and getting half the birds that you need. Right. <clears throat> so are there any programs in, in place to help those guys? I can't speak FSA, I'm afraid there's not, but okay. like I said, just my personal knowledge, I do know that we grow for pilgrims and typically your turnaround time is you have birds for about five weeks and then you are out three weeks to clean the barns and do all the things. Uh, if you are out over the three weeks, they are supplementing. It's not great, but every little bit helps. So I'm not sure how where they're getting that money or what fund that's coming from, but we are getting um, money for everything we're out over the three weeks so okay good so you're, you know firsthand what that what i'm talking about yes sir all right thanks it's always good to have first hand knowledge yes sir and, and the the other um, subject that we've been talking about with losing the grain facilities may fill grain in particular six million bushel uh, I was talking to some farmers in the area that said um, you know they can they have a, quite a bit of on-farm storage the issue they're going to run into is when it's time Fall harvest is over, the grain is in the bins, and now they got to move it to one of the river ports. Mm -hmm. um, you can do the math. Uh, diesel fuel is $5 plus a gallon. The semi trucks get five miles per gallon, roughly. So a dollar a mile just in fuel to move the grain mm -hmm. uh, to, to the elevator. So I, I know our hands are tied. And uh, somebody said, well, is there anything the Department of Agriculture can do to get fuel prices down? And I said, well, if, if they could, he could run for president instead of governor. But, <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, the, the farmers are facing some, some uphill challenges, and, and that's just one, one of them. So any other questions from anyone before we? Okay, we missed Representative Graham. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, was just thinking in terms of the, the comments made about th those barns that were old, older and could not be replaced. Mm -hmm. Are there any mechanism, you may have said this, by which those who cannot afford to rebuild, are there any things in place for people to be able to get some assistance uh, to be able to rebuild those barns? As far as I know, all of that would be coming through their private insurance private company insurance. That, they, okay. that they have. All right. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I'd just like to take the opportunity to make a comment about my former colleague. Um, I want to thank him uh, for uh, really stepping up and, and working uh, public service in public service. Um, you did a fantastic job while you were here in the House. Uh, and I know with your appointment, I know you're doing an excellent job in terms of servicing uh, this Commonwealth. But I just wanted to thank you for your service, not only to your community, but to this Commonwealth and now to the country as a whole. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for those comments, Representative Graham. And, and I would echo that. Uh, you guys know that our, our Ag Committee, if there's a nonpartisan committee in Frankfurt, this is probably it. We're, we're about farmers and, and taking care of business. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, uh, Representative Spore, in the past. And glad to have you on board to uh, work with you going forward. Thank you. If there's nothing else for this group, we'll bring the next group to the table. Thank you for Thank your you time. All. Welcome to the meeting, Dr. Snell, and if you'll introduce yourself for the record, and the floor is yours. Yes, uh, Chairman Heath. Chairman Hornback, it's certainly a pleasure to be here with you all. And, and you may have to pull your mic closer. <laughs> Is the light on? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, couldn't help but, uh, my name is Will Snell, I'm an agricultural economist at the University of Kentucky. I, I couldn't help but have a great smile on when I came in here this morning. Kelly and Susan had put up a picture of my new granddaughter. Mm -hmm. She was born last week. Now, I have to admit, I have a, a long way to go. That's my second grandchild, so I have a long way to go to keep up with my state representative's mom, Representative Cook over there. But anyway, uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, those of you all with grandchildren know that, that that's about as close to a slice of heaven as you can get as those <laughs> grandkids. So again, thanks, Kelly, and, and thanks, Susan, for, for doing that for me. Uh, my chore this morning is to talk about a topic that every one of us in this room are talking about all the time. It doesn't matter if you go to the grocery store or the gas station, farm supply store. Um, you know, everybody's talking about inflation. I was actually on the floor of Rupp Arena at the Alltech conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 2,500 people from 91 different countries. And this gentleman by the name of John Calipari grabbed the microphone and he says, what are we going to do about these fertilizer prices? <laughs> and I couldn't happen, help but, like many of you all, kind of chuckle at uh, Coach Cal talking about fertilizer prices. But again, it's, it's a major issue out there. We certainly know it's impacting all of us. My interest in this topic actually started looming about uh, back in December when I had one of my good friends, some of you all certainly know Hoppy Hinton, texted me. I got my daily text from Hoppy, and his text was, uh, well, inflation is here. Isn't that the greatest thing for agriculture? So those of you all that know Hoppy know that at times you have to kind of take him with a grain of salt and wonder where he's going with that. But that did spark my interest in looking a little bit at it, inflation and how it affects agriculture. So what I want to do today is to kind of look at this from a historical standpoint, and then I want to look at how it's impacting uh, us here in 2022, and then certainly talk about how it's impacting our farmers uh, as well as our consumers out there. So... I want to start off with a slide. Oops. Let's see if I can. Here we go. Just a basic slide here that um, most of you all have had a course or two in economics over time. And you all know that when we talk about, well, let me try the mouse here. There we go. Back up here. Okay. When we talk about textbook definite economics, we generally talk about a rise in prices for a selected basket of goods or too much demand chasing too few goods and services. You all recall those definitions. But I think most of us can relate to our good philosopher Yogi Berra. And Yogi came up with a saying about inflation, nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. So again, we all can relate to this looking at the change in our purchasing power. All of us are certainly being impacted by this as consumers as well as producers out there. And when you look at inflation, uh, inflation is measured, as most of you all know, by the Consumer Price Index. What you may not know is the CPI is actually a, a, a basket of market goods, certainly includes things such as uh, food prices in cars and the price of gasoline. But it's actually a gauge of 80,000 different goods and services. Uh, Chairman Hornback, we're talking all the way from funeral home expenses to haircuts included in the, in the CPI. It's measured in 75 different urban areas across the United States, so it's really not a good measure of rural uh, inflation. Uh, certainly many of our small rural communities probably have higher levels of inflation than some of these urban areas. And it's measured within 23,000 different, 23, different retail establishments. Food is an important component of the CPI, but housing dominates the changes in the CPI, as well as uh, transportation. It's where energy costs, uh, automobile costs, et cetera, are, are uh, plugged in, into that component. But overall, food is about 14% of the nation's CPI. If you look at inflation over the past 50 years, and many of you certainly can remember the uh, Senator Parrott, the early, uh, early 80s and the levels of inflation, the double-digit level of inflation we had for many years during that time period. But 
we also know that through about the past couple of decades or so, we have not had much inflation. I tell my students that pretty much throughout their entire lifetime, they've not experienced much inflation at all. And I always tell the story uh, when I took the Ag Leadership Program, sent a horn back down to Brazil in the early 90s. And we'd go into a restaurant and they would have menu prices on a chalkboard. It's like, why are they putting menu prices on the chalkboard? Well, many of you all can probably figure out. We would actually see prices on the menu change during our meal because at that time, uh, Brazil is experiencing somewhere around a thousand percent annual interest rate. So again, most of us over the past couple of decades certainly have not experienced much inflation until recently. Uh, the uh, last CPI came out last month for April at 8.3 percent. It was actually down a little bit from the month before. Uh, our latest CPI actually comes out in the morning. And, uh, you know, certainly with the increases in fuel prices we've seen over the past month and continued high food prices and, and rental rates, uh, interest rates, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to, to envision that inflation, uh, you know, coming down from the levels that we had last month. So what's caused this run up in inflation? Uh, you all watch the news like I do. There's a lot of finger pointing about what's caused inflation over time. And, you know, where I'm coming from, you can't identify just one single source. A lot of discussion about the government spending. We had, you know, certainly the pandemic expenses. We had all the stimulus checks. We had infrastructure uh, bill pass. And, you know, that accounted for about $6 trillion of federal government spending over the past couple of years, just kind of related to the pandemic. And then you've got monetary policy. The Fed injected about $6 trillion of increased money supply, 40% increase in the money supply over that time period. So again, you've got all this new government spending, you've got all this injection of the money supply. But again, it's other factors. We all know the supply chain, all the way from plants closing, the congestion at ports, uh, the lack of truck drivers, uh, all the supply chain disruptions we've had. On the labor side, you know, higher wage rates, uh, certainly with an ag, weather issues. We've had, uh, you know, droughts in South America. We've had the dry weather out in the western part of the United States, certainly infecting the beef cattle herd. Uh, Representative uh, Tipton, or maybe, uh, you know, you mentioned avian flu. That certainly impacted uh, the poultry sector out there. So, again, a lot of different factors from weather and diseases. And then on top of that, the war in Ukraine. And many of you all know, we'll talk about it here in a few minutes, how important uh, that region of the world is to agriculture in terms of food, in terms of fuel, in terms of fertilizer. So, again, it's a combination of factors that's caused a run-up in inflation. So what about ag? Certainly ag has not been exempt, and this is kind of where hoppy comes into play, that if you look over time, periods when we've had relatively high levels of inflation, we've typically, we'll see in a few minutes here, have had fairly high commodity prices. But what happens when we have high commodity prices? What do farmers want to do? Uh, my best story of this, again, relating back to my experiences with the Ag Leadership Program, I had, uh, we were in South Africa back in 2000, I think, 14. And you all can remember it was a time period with a run-up in global green prices. And we went to what was called a family farm. It was a mom and dad, two brothers and a sister. And I don't know about your perception of family farms in Africa, but mine was it was fairly small scale. But this farmer said, well, the price of grain has been pretty good on the world market last year, so we've decided to raise 29,000 more acres this year. So again, if they can do that in Africa, you know, we can find some more acres in, uh, you know, in Europe, in South America, Central Kentucky, and farmers want to raise more. So again, you have the situation, higher commodity prices encourages higher production. Uh, and then when we have inflation come into play, the Fed gets involved, we get higher interest rates, and that's certainly an important factor impacting uh, farm input prices. So again, want to look at this relationship between the growth in farm commodity prices and the growth in farm input prices. 
The slide here is looking at the changes in farm input costs from January 2020 up until actually April of 2022. Again, the May data, data will come out tomorrow. Uh, farm input cost as a whole across all inputs are up about 24%, whereas the CPI for all goods and services in the economy have risen by about 12%. So again, farm input costs have gone up twice as much as the cost of everything else in the economy. Uh, fertilizer prices, I don't have to tell you, have more than doubled. Uh, again, this slide is a month old. We'll get new data tomorrow, and certainly the diesel and gasoline increases will probably, that we've seen over the past month, will probably exceed 100% uh, growth over that time period. And you can see the other inputs there. So again, I, it's no surprise to any of you all in this room that you know, farm input costs have increased considerably over the past couple of years. But we also know that commodity prices have increased as well. Uh, you can look at the percentage change there over time from our major commodities that we produce here in the, in the state of Kentucky. And again, you see that tremendous growth that we've had over the past uh, two months or two years. Um, so I'm gonna bring this back here a little bit later. We're gonna talk about how all this relates to Kentucky, but. What I want to do now is look at some of the data that I pulled together from a historical standpoint about the changes in input prices versus the changes in commodity prices. The blue line there represents an index of all farm inputs, seed, fertilizer, fuel, labor, interest cost. If you aggregate all those costs over time into an index, whereas the yellow line there represents the index of farm prices received, prices for cattle, prices for corn, soybeans, tobacco, et cetera. And then I'm gonna compare that to the red line. That's the increase in overall prices of all goods and services in the economy, the, the inflation rate. And the first thing I wanna look at is a correlation between the two. And again, relate, going back to your days, uh, in uh, college when you, you, you had a statistics course, you, you figure correlation coefficients. And those coefficients generally range from a plus one, which would say that two variables are ex perfectly correlated. When one goes up, the other one goes up by the same amount. Or if it's negative one, they go down by the same amount. If it's equal to zero, then there's no statistical relation. Oops. Ah, shoot. Sorry. So again, you all don't have to do any statistical calculation to look at those lines to realize that the prices paid are highly correlated with the price rate of inflation as well as the prices received. You can see that correlation coefficient almost equal to one. But then the question becomes, okay. Which one of these has gone up by a larger amount over time? Overall, during this 50-year period, we've seen the prices of all goods and services in the economy, the inflation rate average about 4%. The prices that farmers have received have gone up 3.2%, so farm prices have gone up less than the overall rate of inflation. But the prices that farmers have paid have gone up by a larger percent. But also when I looked at the data over that 50 year time period, and those of you all that farm can relate to this, that when farm commodity prices are generally matching the rate of inflation increases, when representing when farm prices are going up, input prices typically go up a little bit more. But when farm prices start coming down with the rate of inflation, input prices do not come down accordingly. They come down at a slower pace. So I see a few nods in, in the, uh, by the committee members. So again, you can relate to that. So again, you got inflation impacting commodity prices, but impacting input prices. What about farm income? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that typically if you look at this data where you look at it for 50 years or 100 years, that those input prices are going up at a faster rate than the rate of farm prices are going up. So when you look at the correlation coefficient, you see it's a negative, that there is a, a negative relationship between the rate of inflation and farm income. That typically during 
sustained periods of high inflation, we have farm income to come down. But again, inflation affects not only these variables, but a lot of other variables that we're watching the farm economy. Uh, let me start off by looking at, at land values. Um, economists like to look at this ratio to, to come up with the value of farmland or any asset. You look at the ratio of what kind I expect from that parcel of land, how much income can it generate over time, and then you divide that by an interest rate. We're basically discounting those returns over time to get what that parcel of land is worth in dollars today. So again, higher inflation, we'll see in a few minutes, we typically have higher returns to, to agricultural land, but we have higher inflation, we have higher interest rates, and that typically has a negative impact on land values. So then the question becomes, which one sort of wins out? You've got inflation causing returns to go up, but inflation resulting in higher interest rates, and that's pulling down the cost of farmland. This slide here is looking at interest rates mapped against farmland prices over time here in Kentucky. Uh, and you look back in the decade of the 70s, that black line representing higher interest rates, and eventually when the Fed stepped in, um, you know, as, as a result to uh, curb inflation, that we saw eventually land prices decline in the early 80s. And then we had a couple of decades of pretty sustained lower interest rates. And you can see that growth we had in land values. We had a little bump 2008, 2009 with a great recession. But there's no doubt that over time in, in, in recent years, these low interest rates have certainly been there to support higher land values. I think the best slide to show what I'm, I'm trying to show here is looking at this slide here that looks at the green area, which is the annual change in inter, uh, uh, land values. The annual change in land values and those red bars represent the annual change in inflation. And you can see for the most part, if you look at this as actually over 100 years, that the change in that green area, land values, is typically greater than the change in inflation. So as a result, okay, there's the data that over time it's averaged a 4.6 increase average change in land values where inflation over that 100 year period was about 2.8%. So what that results in that the real value of farmland in Kentucky has been over time increasing. In which you've always heard and the data certainly uh, supports that land is a good hedge against inflation, that land values typically increase greater than the rate of inflation. So what about export markets? We know that agriculture is very, very dependent upon strong export markets. How does inflation impact exchange rates? Well, again, higher levels of inflation, higher interest rates. When interest rates go up here in the United States, we get not only U.S. investors, but investors around the world want to uh, invest in U.S. securities, long-term securities. So that typically increases the demand for U.S. financial securities. Higher demand for U.S. dollar-denominated interest rates increases the value of the dollar. And again, most of you all know that when we have a high-value dollar, that typically is uh, detrimental to exports. Uh, it costs foreign buyers more of their currency to buy U.S. goods. So Again, just looking at some of the data over time, again, back in the early 70s when that blue line came down, that represents the exchange rate. We saw increases in those red bars representing uh, exports. Um, I guess most, of, then all of a sudden, you know, interest rates went up, the value of the dollar went up, we saw exports come down. But then we had this period from 2002 to about 2014 where the value of the dollar was declining. And uh, Senator Thayer, we had a big boost in, in agricultural exports during that time period. And recently, certainly with higher interest rates and higher levels of uh, the, the value of the dollar increasing, that's been a detriment to our exports, but we've been very fortunate with some other factors that come into play, sort of the, the phase one Chinese deal, uh, some global weather events that have enabled U.S. agricultural exports to continue to increase. But again, the point being is that typically when we have inflation, 
leads to higher interest rates, leads to higher value of the dollar, and that is a concern for an export-dependent sector like agriculture. So let me kind of get into what all this means for the Kentucky farm economy. I think we've made it pretty clear that uh, inflation is impacting our farmers on both commodity prices as well as input prices. And what does that mean for uh, the current, current crop year? This is a slide that we had actually the department put together late last year. We present this data at the uh, Kentucky Farm Bureau Convention in December where we make some estimates on the current cash receipt and farm income levels and then we make some projections for 2022 for the upcoming year. Uh, the, the official data for 2021 won't come out till later this summer. But back in December, on the midst of higher commodity prices, relatively low input prices, uh, very, very strong crop yields, some improvements in livestock uh, prices and, and returns, we estimated that farm cash receipts for the first time in the history of Kentucky agriculture would approach $7 billion. And even when you pulled out the input cost at that time for the preceding crop year, relatively low, and even with lower government payments, so strong export markets and the strong yields we had here in Kentucky, we were anticipating that our net farm income was going to be one of the highest levels over the past seven or eight years as farm income rebounded. You see the data there for 2018 and 2020, where farm income was certainly supported by a lot of the farm programs that uh, Dean Director Smore talked about and his staff. Uh, but again, last year, most of the money was made from the marketplace. So what about 2022? What I have here is some data from one of my colleagues, Greg Hallett, who puts together our grain budgets. Uh, the table on the left represents the cost of, uh, that we had in our budgets. I think he put these budgets together back in, in March and April. And you can look at the various costs there for corn and soybeans, certainly the higher fertilizer cost. Um, you can note down at the bottom there that we had... Uh, Diesel fuel at 425 a gallon. Obviously, again, this is a couple of months old. We'd have to, as Representative Heath pointed out, it would certainly be north of $5 right now. But the bottom line is, if we look at this from a historical standpoint, this is by far the highest cost we've ever seen per acre in putting out an acre of our green crops. I don't have wheat shown there, but again, all three of our grains would represent the highest cost we've ever experienced. And what I've got on the table there on the right, if you look at, see if I can move this mouse without, well, it's right here. Yeah, if you can look at over here at the cost, we've got the budgets for corn and soybeans for 2020 and 2022. We projected back in March and April, it'd be about 50% higher cost for corn, a little bit lower for soybeans, due to not as much dependent upon fertilizer cost. But look at that price up there at the top. At that time, we were anticipating uh, corn prices in the fall being 660 a bushel. And if you look at the prices today on the board, as well as you know, fall delivery, you know, they're at seven dollars plus a, a bushel. Uh, soybean prices are, are higher than that 1515 that we're showing there. So even in the midst of these high input prices, the Commodity prices that we're seeing today more than offset the cost of the higher inputs. Now, one, that assumes that we have a crop. That assumes we have, in this case, average yields. It assumes a farmer is perhaps we're encouraging to market some of that crop now, but certainly we'll will we receive those you know average prices that we have up there in the fall. At, you know, I was talking to a farmer earlier this week. He called. We were talking about the same scenario. He was talking about his input cost. And, I, you know, I point out, you know, but what about the price you're anticipating? He said, well, yeah, it's certainly higher than I've ever seen, you know, in, in recent years. And he says the potential is there. But he says, I just came from Southern States, and I just saw that, you know, I have a $100,000 bill there. That money is already out the door, and I have all this risk. So again, 
on paper, it's easy for somebody like me to come up here and say that we have the potential for our grain farmers to do well in 2022, given what we're projecting on prices and costs. But again, we're going to be very dependent upon Mother Nature to come through as well. Looking at a couple of our other major enterprises, uh, I talked with my good colleague Kenny Burdines, our beef marketing specialist. Uh, he estimates that input costs for beef producers with higher feed costs, higher fuel, fencing, uh, higher animal costs, that they're up about 20 to 22 percent, uh, 20 to 30 percent here in 2022. Price, calf prices are going to be higher, he anticipates, in the fall compared to where we were last year. Overall, he feels like our cow-calf producers will be able to recoup most of that higher input costs, but certainly not add much to overhead, uh, return on overhead as a result of the higher input costs. Feels a little bit more optimistic on stocker cattle, uh, given where the prices that are on the board. Certainly been very surprised that consumer demand for beef has still remained relatively high despite the high prices in the export market. Uh, I think Dave Maples would agree that continues to still show uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, strength uh, overside, overseas and moving a lot of our, our beef products. As far as tobacco, um, we've been talking to the tobacco companies for many years about supply security, but they've always found enough pounds to, to meet their needs here in the U.S. market. But I think this is the first time where the companies are a little bit worried about supply security. Uh, many from your counties, you know, you have very few tobacco producers left. Uh, We've had several companies boost contract prices not only once, twice. I think one company, uh, Chairman Hornbach's, boosted three times. So they're up 7, 10, 12 percent, depending on the type of tobacco, but input costs from our budgets are up about 10 to 20 percent. So again, those margins are going to be extremely tight, and we're going to have to depend upon uh, probably above average, much well above average yields to pan out on tobacco. So. Again, where does this lead us to that preceding slide? This slide here that I have here on the left was where we were in December in terms of looking at 2022. Uh, certainly we were looking at higher input or higher uh, commodity prices, but not at the level we're seeing right now. At that time back in December at the Farm Bureau annual meeting, we were saying that for 2022, we thought we could push $7 billion and probably exceed it a little bit for for 2022, given our price scenarios for the upcoming year. But I feel pretty confident to say as long as we have decent growing conditions and with the prices we're expecting this fall, that we are going to well exceed $7 billion in cash receipts uh, for agriculture for 2022. As far as net farm income, um, you know, again, there's no doubt input costs are going to be up, but those higher cash receipts. Uh, I think we'll more than offset uh, our inputs cost increase as well as uh, the fact that we're not going to have a very much in terms of government payments. So again, where I come to you today is saying that despite inflation, this is kind of my take home message, despite inflation, and again, making a lot of assumptions about good weather patterns, uh, the export market remaining relatively strong, um, feel like 2023 will be, or 2022, will be a good year for Kentucky agriculture. A good year. Maybe not a great year, but a good year. Our biggest concern right now is what happens in 2023. The world will respond to these higher commodity prices. And we will see probably some pushback, lower commodity prices, especially crop prices we anticipate for 2023. But again, remember what I said earlier, those input prices tend to be fairly sticky. They're, we typically will not or have not seen them come down as fast as commodity prices. And as a result, that's our biggest concern as we kind of look at, at 2023. All right, let me just finish up and talk a little bit on the consumer side. And we're going to talk about food prices. And again, something that all of us are attuned to. I, I feel very confident talking about food prices because one, I teach a a food and ag marketing course. We used to talk more about ag marketing, but now with my student base, I talk more about food marketing. Uh, so I'll watch these prices. Plus, I am probably responsible for about 80 or 90% of the grocery shopping in our household. 
And I not only uh, like to go to the grocery, uh, I like to kind of watch consumers and how they respond to price increases. And I remember early in the pandemic, kind of being shocked on, you know, turning on the TV and consumers were talking about, well, food prices are up 20, 30 percent, the highest I've ever paid. It's double from what I paid six months ago. And, you know, when I went to the store, yeah, there were some empty meat cases from time to time. But early in, during the pandemic, food prices, just due to the fact that we had competition out there and ample supplies of most foods, didn't have the toilet paper, may not have the, the beef when we wanted it. But for the most pro time, food prices at that time were fairly stable. But I'm telling you, and you all know, the past few months, it's been a shocker to go into the grocery store. Uh, I was in Kroger the other day, and they had buy one, get one free chuck roast. So I thought, well, that's pretty good. But when I picked up a fairly medium-sized chuck roast, it was $35 for that one chuck roast. Uh, I was at a specialty meat shop in uh, Florida a couple of months ago and went in and looked in the meat case, and filet mignons were $49.99 a pound. Now, I might expect to pay that at, at Tony's or Jeff Ruby's, but the to have to, to pay that at the, at the butcher shop is, is another thing. But again, you look at these prices, and again, we'll get some updates tomorrow, but you know, food prices have gone up. Again, I tell my students, during most of their lifetime, they've never seen food price inflation until now. So it's up about 10%. Uh, but what is amazing, or let me back up and, and talk a little bit about what's driving this. Certainly higher commodity prices, higher price of wheat, higher price of corn, soybean, cooking oil, etc., beef prices. We know those commodity prices are driving higher food prices. But I always show this chart in class, that the cost of our food, when we go to the grocery store and spend a dollar on food, 85% of that cost is beyond the farm gate. So higher commodity prices do have an impact, but it's all these other factors, our fuel costs, labor costs, processing costs, packaging costs, uh, export markets been very strong on food exports. All these factors are coming into play. So, yes, we've seen a tremendous amount of food price inflation here in the United States. But I also like to show this chart as I uh, begin to finish up here. Look at that red line. That's U.S. food price volatility. Check out that green line. That is the average volatility in global food prices. We're very blessed in this country with the infrastructure we have, the efficiency that we have, the competition we have in our food marketing system, despite um, you know, some of the challenges we all talk about. Food prices today are up 10% here in the United States. They're up about 30% worldwide. And again, a lot of this relates to what's going on with the war in Ukraine. Uh, you all know that Ukraine and Russia considered somewhat the, the breadbasket of the world in terms of especially green output. Uh, look at those numbers there and how important they are on international trade of uh, various component, uh, commodities. But the one number I always point out, it just boggles my mind, is that Russia and Ukraine together account for about 12% of the world food calories. Think about that. Those two countries, we're not talking South American Brazil and Argentina and the United States, you know, big agricultural sectors. We're talking those two countries, 12%. And now with all the trade disruptions, they can't get their crops out. Uh, they can't export. Uh, certainly most, you know, we're not so much impacted here in the United States from those markets being shut off. But if you look in the Middle East, look in African countries, a lot of the lower income countries is where a lot of this uh, grain from these two markets typically end up. So you all probably read about it, but it's, it, it's true that we are in the midst of a global food crisis. And you may have seen some of the news over the past couple of weeks, uh, been some discussions with uh, President Putin and uh, some of the European leaders and, and uh, leaders from Turkey on trying to get some of this grain out of those countries to these developing countries, these low-income countries, to, to try to uh, prevent this from happening. Uh, but again, there's a lot of uh, concern out there in a, a global global sector. So I'll just uh, finish by saying, you know, I'm hoping that by the end of this year, we'll see some moderation in food prices. It's going to take a while for the supply chain to, to uh, you know, work out some of the kinks. Uh, 
You know, the Biden administration is working in a lot of different areas and trying to improve competition in the marketplace, to improve uh, capacity, beef uh, capacity, uh, meat capacity out there. We're doing some efforts here in Kentucky through uh, the Ag Development Fund to increase uh, slaughter capacity. Uh, you've got efforts to try to increase production longer term by, you know, double cropping and some of the other measures to increase, uh, you know, production of crops. But it's going to take a while for food price inflation to moderate. Uh, and again, I'll just finish up by emphasize the point I said earlier. We feel pretty good about the ag economy for 2023, 2022. We've got some carryover money from last year from a good crop year. Uh, we've got very strong export markets right now. Yes, input prices are higher, but we feel pretty good about 2022. But the concern is if we don't see some moderation in input prices for 2023, that's where the concern lies in, in the coming year. So with that, uh, Chairman Heath, I will uh, close my comments and be glad to entertain some, some questions or, or comments. Thank you, Dr. Snell. Very good information. Uh, appreciate the handout in our folder so we can take it back and, and um, try to memorize that for some of our constituents back home. But uh, Chairman Hornback has questions or comments. Just a couple of comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing I would like to tell everybody here is that uh, how fortunate we are in the ag industry to have Will Snell. Uh, Will forever uh, has been the one uh, to help us with projections and numbers and look what the ag economy is like here in Kentucky. And, and Will, I truly appreciate all the help you've been to me and to all the farmers uh, throughout Kentucky. and wanted to just uh, make everybody aware of that. Thank you. A uh, couple things, a couple questions, Will. Uh, you talked early about uh, inflation and the reasons for inflation. And it appears that the $6 trillion of new money we injected into the economy uh, had a great effect and is still having a great effect on the supply side, What the I mean the demand side mm -hmm. and what demand is. How long does it take uh, to move that money through the system so that it lessens demand, which is kind of an artificial demand from, from monies that really shouldn't have been there? Yeah, I was reading an article the other day that, you know, about how much, basically the same concept you're talking about. It has all this money made its way through uh, the economy? And the answer, the analysis they had is no. That's still money on the sideline. Uh, you know, many of us tried to go out and buy, you know, a new tractor, new truck. Uh, we ended up doing a lot of home improvement projects, but there's still money on, on the side. And to be honest with you, when I was, I was looking at these numbers over time, I was shocked how well the economy in the short run did when basically the whole country, the whole economy shut down. But now we're kind of paying the price for it. Uh, we were able to artificially keep our economy relatively strong, um, and we would have seen some detrimental impacts, there's no doubt, in the short term. Uh, but there will be a lot of analysis for the next several decades on whether that was the right policy prescription at that time or not. But again, uh, we're, we're, it's not the only factor. But certainly, I think uh, had an impact on the overall rate of inflation. So, and just another car, another observation on your uh, uh, worksheet you had there for ag inputs uh, versus return and everything. The over for me, I mean, the overhead costs have gone up a lot more than what some of those other costs have gone up. Uh, if you look at uh, just equipment uh, cost, mm -hmm. I mean, that have gone up over 20% in the last year. So mm -hmm. those returns that show 200% uh, increase, 300% increase in a year's time, uh, net return, are probably not as realistic as uh, what farmers are going to see uh, because of overhead costs, interest costs, because most farmers, uh, as Dean had said back early and their folks, uh, carry a debt on that. So their, their interest costs, for one right. thing are going to be close to double this year of what they were last year, plus carrying a lot more debt uh, because of the increase in all those inputs and everything. So I just want to let the, you know, the people know that the, the returns are not as good as what they appear, although it is going to be a good year. Right. Uh, it's not going to be a great year, and still see what Mother Nature does. But I sure appreciate you, Will, and, and what all you do for AG. Uh, I certainly concur with those comments in terms of looking at more from a long-term perspective. Um, we all know that farmers look at basically year to year, but those 
those equipment costs are over a longer time period and, and they're going to be financed at higher rates. So uh, one final comment, uh, totally appreciate all the support you've given to me in your position in the state legislature over the years. And now I'm glad you're going to have more time to take care of Hoppy for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Rep Representative McPherson. Yes, and you might correct me if I'm wrong, but in the early middle 80s, I think the uh, percent that it took for a person to feed themselves was probably 15, 16 percent of their income. And by the late 80s, it came down to, you know, just maybe under 10 percent, mm -hmm. 11 percent, something. That, do you know what that percentage of what it costs to feed you now versus your income? We are down, uh, as you say, below 10 percent. I think some of the latest data would indicate about nine and a half percent. So again, uh, I made some reference to those countries in the, the Middle East and Africa where you know it's it, it's over 50 percent of their income. So again, not only higher food prices, but uh, lack of income and uh, more dependence upon in, that income to to uh, you know pay for for food costs. So again, we're very blessed in this country, but good point. Again, it points out to the, the uh, efficiency of our ag and food system. It's, it's something we take for granted. We saw what happens when it doesn't run efficiently. Uh, but again, uh, long term, we'll get some of those kinks uh, modified. And, and again, we're very blessed to be in this country with the food marketing system we have. Representative Cook. Oh, I didn't talk equine. At least, I wasn't going to bring up equine. Well, it, <laughs> from what happened last fall, I, I'm still Is that pretty optimistic. Happen again this fall, we're going to be okay on that. Uh, All those feed costs are going up, though, right? That's right. Yeah, Anthony. Every time he calls now, it's not good news. It continue continues to go up. Uh, Doctor Snow, I was never lucky enough to have you in class. I know at least three of my siblings, I believe, believe went through your program there. Uh, I wish I was armed with this information. I was in the John Deere store yesterday buying. Uh, blew out a broke a PTO shaft and was in there mm. purchasing that and conversation, you know, all the farmers, everybody's lined up getting parts. Yeah. Um, trying to get back in the field. And so this there's actually some good news in here, I think, um, to take out of this. But the one thing that concerns me a lot a lot that we were talking about yesterday, um, and and I did some math here and even, you know, the, I think you had your fuel cost at four twenty five a gallon. I think yeah, you could yeah. go up farm it's fuel could of, get yeah. it could go up to seven fifty a gallon. You could spread it out, you know, five hundred dollars extra fuel on a fifty acre field and you'd probably uh according to these numbers here, still make Take the money. But another major problem we're having, not only the timeline of getting parts that continually get slower. I was lucky enough they had mine, but my part was in store there. But it was uh, roughly double the same part was even 18 months ago. Um, that's going up. And then the other part of it's the labor. That's just mm -hmm. absolutely. And I know every community from whether it's teachers or anything else, but the ag community is absolutely getting squashed in the labor. And I think – um, sometimes it's harder to pay those higher numbers at la on labor for agriculture. So I think it's continuing to follow farther behind, but there's just no help available to uh, work the equipment. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, we, once we get some maybe a little bit more calmness in these geopolitical conflicts we're having right now and we get more oil production in, in the Middle East, I mean, we will see some moderation in fuel prices, I think. Uh, that will help the inflation rate, but wage rates, uh, once wages go up, again, that, I would think they would be fairly rigid. It's going to be hard to, to pull down those wage rates. And as a result, you know, certainly in agriculture, it's not only the, the rate, but also just the supply of labor. So that's certainly a big challenge. And I think, you know, agriculture is not going to be immune that what we're seeing in agribusiness as well as other sectors out there to try to become more automated um, but you know, it's, it's a challenge in agriculture to go that route. You know, it's, and I use this as an example. Um, we have a vendor right there in Paris that they produce ingredients for the COVID vaccine. So Department of Homeland Security mandates, they stay open. They're producing 12 of the 21 ingredients, I think. They're starting pay right now, $21 an hour. Mm -hmm. And they're hiring anybody that comes in through the door. And that man, it is just making it harder and harder to compete because that's, that's hard to pay in agriculture. Certainly. Anything else for Dr. Snell? Appreciate your time and always the information and your availability to this committee. And if no one has anything else, then we'll adjourn.
Oh, sorry. Uh, next meeting, July the 7th, 9 a.m., right here in this room.